Dr. Sam Medeiros. Uh, talk of the day about a new procedure called eustachian tube dilation. Um, it's through a, pr a product called the ERA, A-E-R-A -A, balloon. Uh, very similar to a lot of the uh, balloons we've used in the sinuses now for about 10 to 15 years. Um, but it's now been uh, figured out how to use this in the eustachian tube for another very obnoxious problem for a lot of adults. Uh, definitely doesn't happen to as many adults as sinus trouble, but a lot of adults did still trouble, have trouble with recurrent ear infections, fluid in the ears, and or just feeling pressure in the ears uh, with uh, kind of sucked in eardrums when we look at it. Uh, because of this, we've only really had you know, nasal sprays in the past and um, tubes, which is not ideal on adults. We do that often on kids. We expect them to grow out of it, and as I often tell adults, I'm not sure when you're going to grow out of it. And so we try to find everything we can to get the ears healthy, and sometimes everything we can do still doesn't change the anatomic issues they're having or the years of trouble that's already been there. Um, so this is an attempt to, to correct that. And thankfully, we finally have a safe way of doing this. Um, in general, we've been taught in the past that we try not to touch the eustachian tube opening. Uh, there's a lot of procedures that have been developed and some that are still done in very select communities and by uh, likely just otologists uh, to try to open these things up and even those have been met with middling results. Um, this has been a nice safe way to do it. The idea behind it is that uh, through, with a brief proce procedure, uh, very little uh, blood loss involved, very little um, real uh, surgery involved. It's much more of a procedure than a surgery. We look at the back of the nose of the camera like we often do in clinic and in the operating room with the camera and then we advance this balloon up the eustachian tube. The opening is there. It's We know exactly where it is. We see it every time we look past uh, the back of someone's nose. Um, we're able to, they've got this um, engineered so that it slides right up in the eustachian tube. It doesn't go all the way into the middle ear and there's some good reasons why it doesn't. Um, but it gets up through about three quarters of the eustachian tube. And it's a three quarters of the eustachian tube that is in communication with the back of the nose. And again, that's where most of the trouble comes in as far as the inflammation and dysfunction. Because that's the part that actually has a muscle that can open and close it as well. Um, so then it dilates open this eustachian tube. It dilates it open to probably about four times its normal opening. It doesn't stay in there, but it does dilate and hold that open. Uh, to some degree, I'm sure it does kind of get more stretch on those muscles to get a little bit more room, and it does to some degree remodel the cartilage that makes up about half of the, the one wall of that tube, um, and that probably is helpful in the future as well in just changing the anatomy. Also, we hold it up much longer than we do in uh, sinus patients where we're really remodeling some eggshell thin bone. That tends to remodel fairly quickly. Um, this is a little different. We're actually trying to reset that lining and they actually have pretty good data on this now and they've done some biopsies before the procedure immediately after and six weeks after and this has consistently shown that this inflamed lining that has a lot of white blood cells beneath the lining which is kind of our you were to do a biopsy, it's how we say there's inflammation there, and there was consistently inflammation there on patients who had this kind of trouble. Um, after, right after the procedure, those sometimes are still there, but this thickened lining over those white blood cells, um, really thickened tissue, multiple layers of tissue, lots and lots of um, mucus secreting cells, which again, in the eustachian tube can really gum up the works, um, then slough off fairly quickly. And it's sort of like dermabrasion for the eustachian tube. People have sometimes heard of that. They want to smooth out an area of the skin or they got a rough patch of the skin. And essentially they know it's not you know, pretty right off the bat. It, it kind of gets it down to the deeper layer to where it's kind of red and needs to heal over, but it heals over nice and smooth. Um, that is for you know, lack of a better term, what we're doing to the eustachian tube. So we're getting that lining, we're holding pressure long enough that it actually causes that lining to slough. And they've got pretty good uh, data then at six weeks out. And we think there's always that time taken for healing to occur, uh, for the lining to kind of regenerate. But the lining that regenerates uh, consistently has been um, less swollen. Uh, about a third as many uh, mucus secreting cells. And typically you don't see that inflammation or those white blood cells underneath that lining. So it's a huge change. We have, that gives us a lot more room in the eustachian tube. Plus we don't have that setup that seems to cause this chronic problem to begin with. Um, so all this is geared at that tube that connects the back of the nose to the ear. Its, it's job is to keep your ear clear. When you're on an airplane and you're chewing and you're, and you're swallowing and you're yawning and doing everything you can to get that open, that's kind of what we're working on there. Um, and it's in a fairly non-invasive, uh, painless way. In fact, that we really shouldn't see much bleeding with the procedure. And uh, afterwards, typically pain is very, very low. 
So given all things you could do in this situation, this seems to be the best of both worlds. Now this is fairly new. Uh, I just did my training on it over uh, Veterans Day in November, and I was the first person in Nebraska to train on it. And having said that, obviously it's a pretty important thing in ENT, and I will be followed very closely by others. Um, but it, I think it's an important thing for our patients. That's uh, something that we are already offering here. Um, and uh, obviously it's nice to get your hands in there first because we can get more of these done before um, some other parts of the state or maybe other parts of the city have even caught on to decide they want to try this. Uh, I do think it's going to be a huge help for patients who are coming in here frequently with ear issues as an adult. As of yet, it's not approved for children um, because this was for that problem that you can't grow out of. So it's 22 and older. I'm not sure why in this situation 21 is not an adult, but in this, that was where the study went. My guess is we'll have that open up in the future. There's already been some pilot studies showing quite a bit of a benefit even for children. I can't say that we can do that at this point, but uh, as the indications open up, I'm sure we'll be able to do that and hopefully make a big difference in the future. So if you're having these kinds of problems, absolutely, we'd love to take a look at you and talk to you about it, and feel free to make an appointment.